un altro grandissimo maestro internazionale, Lauren McCracken degli Stati Uniti. Thank you, Lauren, it's a great honor for us. È la prima volta che fa una dimostrazione, una spiegazione del genere in Italia. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Uh, I have a friend in, uh, in New Hampshire, and he collects pre-revolutionary war antiques. And he has this wonderful collection of pewter, uh, and, and so I set, set it up next to a window, just like the Dutch. And the thing to remember about the Dutch is that you think of Vermeer, you think of Rembrandt, you think of Peter Klaus, all of this, the light is always from the left. About 90% of all painting over history, the light is from the left. Our eyes have become so accustomed to it, if the light is from the right, it takes us a couple of seconds to understand it. So, so my goal in painting in realism is to share with you what I saw at that moment. Because I think that I see with a slight higher degree of visual acuity. So, so I want to share with my viewer the story of what I saw when I saw these objects. But the famous American author Henry David Thoreau said, it is not important what you look at, what you see is what matters. You see a forest. <coughs> Some people just see a forest. Some people see the trees. Some, some people see the limbs on the trees. Some people see the leaves on the limbs on the trees. I see the veins in the leaves. I'm trying to teach you to see to look a little closer, to see a little bit more detail than you saw yesterday. So I take my photograph, and then I take a high-definition projector, and I project it onto the wall. And I pin my paper on the wall, and then I trace the basic shapes. And then I take it to my painting board, and then I add the details. So the drawing may take five or six hours. I have found that if the detail is not in the drawing, it probably won't be in the finished painting. You know, if you're trying to do photorealism, you can't remember all the details. Then I make big photos. This is the photo over the painting. You can see that I use a, a tape and I mask, very, and I cut it with an X-Acto knife. It gives me these very precise edges. You can see. I painted this, then the next the next to it, I masked this, and I use a lot of this is the masking fluid. In in watercolor, the basic rule is to paint light to dark. Yes, we all know this. But the higher rule is to paint if, you're, if there's something in the painting you've never done before, do that first. So, because if you did all of these things you know how to paint, and then you come back and mess this up, you've ruined the whole thing. And, and here I have, I have uh, removed all the tape and the, and the masking fluid, and then I've come back. Na nature doesn't have hard lines like this, so that's more like nature. When I get to this point, what I do is I cover the whole painting with lightweight tracing paper. I cut out the area just what I'm going to paint that morning. So when I'm moving my paint from my palette back to the painting and there's a drop, I don't harm the paint. I'm painting, this is called a British two brush technique. One brush with the pigment, one with water. Because then I can use the, the, the brush with the pigment and then the water and I make things round because it spreads the paint out very evenly. Sometimes you use it the other way, the two brush technique, the other, you start with the water and then add. Here's where I'm using that two brush technique to, to make it look round. The clementines, the oranges, are a 
reflected 16 times. <laughs> One piece at a time. Every now and then you have to take everything off and step back to be sure that it is consistent. We want painting to be difficult. We want painting to be fun. I just paint for the joy of it. And then again, stepping back, just looking at the consistency, being sure everything works together and the composition is improving. Now, let's talk about the black background. First of all, I mix my own black. I find lamp black, which is what you can buy, to be a very dead black. I start with alizarin crimson, deep violet, a deep, deep violet, and a lot of Prussian blue. So what we've got are the three deepest hues on our palette. And you mix them, and you mix them, and then you mix them some more, and some more, and some more. And what happens is you have this wonderful, deepest, deepest violet. You just want to swim in it. It's so <laughs> So then how do we move that from this deep, deep violet into a black? We start adding our earth tones. Burnt sienna. Sepia, if you have it. And that starts a shift toward the black. But it's still a little blue. So if you wanted, uh, if you're mixing your paint uh, and you wanted to, uh, and you had a violet, you would maybe mix a little yellow with it to make it uh, a little warmer, right? But if you put yellow in this, so you use quinacridone. You, need, you use another chemistry. What we've done here is we've used uh, ground up chemicals and we've used uh, ground up earths. And then, now we go to a modern chemistry, the quinacridones. You add quinacridone gold, a little bit, mix, test. A little bit, test. And the way you test, you have two brushes. You get just a little bit of the paint and you put it on the paper and then a, a, a brush full of water, spread it out until it's very, very thin. Because when it's dense, you can't see what color. But as you spread it out, then you, you can see it's true color. So you just keep adding those little earth tones, a little quinacridone, mix, 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 test. And then when it spreads out, a beautiful neutral gray. So then, so I, I mix it in, in a jar like this with a tight lid. And that will last me two or three months. And before I paint the background, I add an undercoating. And I do it for two reasons. One is a technical reason. There is sizing on the paper. It's, it's a coating on the paper called sizing. And sometimes it will have just a little dot too much of the sizing. And the paint won't stick to that little bitty point. The bridge call that a holiday. So this allows me to find the holidays. And then I can just put a little bit more water on it and get the sizing off and I seal the paper. So, and then emotional reason. Remember that the joy of transparent watercolor is that it is transparent. The light comes and it strikes the color and it comes back to your eye from the surface of the color. It comes back to your eye. So you see the reflect the reflected light. Also allows the light to go all the way through the paint and strike the paper. And the light bounces back through the color to your light, to your eye. And that's why watercolor looks so luminous as opposed to acrylics. So the light goes even through the black, through the orange, and brings that light back up. So your, so your first impression, that's just black. But your brain sees the reflected color coming back up. So you have an emotional response. Under this, it's very warm, so you, that is projecting a warmth to you. So if I'm just doing a painting, uh, that has, uh, let's say, just silver and glass, and I want it to look very metallic. 
I may use a deep blue, like an ultramarine or a cobalt blue one. And that, that in your mind will reinforce the coldness of the metal. And the good news is this can be very rough, very quickly. It doesn't have to be very fine. But you can also see again, I've covered it with the tracing paper, so if it spatters, I don't ruin it. And you see down here, I've used a deeper red, which is more related to the, the color of the tabletop. This is a combination of the black and all kinds of browns to, to make the tabletop sit very solid. You put on the, the background, and the paint is very thick, like a yogurt. And you start down here, and you go continuously, slowly, 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 all the way, not stopping. You have to keep the edge wet. And I use very old, old brushes to, work. to make this work and make it look smooth. You really, did, you know, make making it really rough, the surface very rough. We, we call it scumbling. I don't know what you call it. So you're, you're out here painting a wet edge, but then you're going back where it's wet and roughing it up. That, 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 that caught, the light then can't reflect. The light gets absorbed in it. Right. But you can't stop until you all the way around. Because if you, try, if you try to paint more over it, you're going to take up more paint than you put down. So it's a one opportunity. We, we do, uh, we come back in what uh, Ian Stewart calls the bits, you know, the little bitty details, you add them. And then what I do is I, I, I take the painting and I put it up in my studio and I live with it for two weeks because it's very easy to get lost in all those details and sometimes you miss something a week later and I realized that I had painted over that very important detail. So I took out my knife, cut out the paper, yeah, because it's already black. You can't change it. You can't take all the paint back out. But you, and that's one one reason I use 300 pound paper, so I can put those little details back.